think for a moment of all they mean. Strength, security, safety, romance, mystery. And think of all they have seen, the great sailing ships, the birth of a nation, heroism, tragedy, war, the passage of time, and change. They mean so much, and they have seen so much. These are the marvelous lighthouses of Maine. Hello, I'm Tim Harrison of the American Lighthouse Foundation, and I'm here at Little River Light Station in Cutler, Maine, to share with you some of these fascinating places and their rich histories. Well, we'll share with you what we can, because you see, some of the history of these lights has actually disappeared. Some have fallen to time with the ravages of weather, and some have been lost to accidents. After having survived more than 70 years of wind and weather in Machias Bay, Avery Rock Light is gone entirely. It was lost to nature, finally falling to a storm in 1946. Crabtree Ledge Light also gave way to the weather. Simple disregard took much of Eagle Island Light. Despite the fact that the structures themselves were in good shape, when the buildings were offered for sale, no one came forward to invest in the light's future. And all but the tower of Eagle Island Light Station was demolished in 1964. And there are other places where only part of the original station remains. Though the tower itself still stands, all the other buildings at Portland Breakwater are all gone. One of Maine's northernmost lights, St. Croix River Light, is entirely gone, destroyed by fire. There are even lights that have disappeared so completely that we have little record of what they have looked like or what their original design was. Lighthouse buffs recently uncovered the remnants of a light station at Abacadasset. Here, a pair of range lights once aided those navigating the Kennebec River, but because the history of the station itself is gone, except for this one lonely photograph of the keeper on top of his favorite horse. Every one of these lights extinguished was a tremendous loss. But what's perhaps worse is that some of the history of these and other main lights have itself disappeared. The photos, the records, even the memories. So much has already slipped through our fingers. But we are uncovering more every day as people become aware of the valuable historical information that sits quietly waiting in boxes in their attics, in family scrapbooks, in the precious memories of those who actually live part of their lives at the lights, and family stories told by the children of the lights to their own children. So we can't share everything here, and of course, time wouldn't allow us to anyway. After all, Maine has 68 lighthouses still in existence, each rich with its own legends and lore, even if we are unsure of some of it. But this journey through time includes some stories of the lights you've probably not heard before. So let's get started. Let's see what life was really like at the light. Stand at a lighthouse today and close your eyes. Now imagine you take away all the things that make our modern lives go. There's no television, no radio. The internet hasn't been invented yet. There are no telephones, pagers, or cell phones to ring or beep at you. There's no automobiles to carry you across the bridges to shore. Take away even the electric light and central heating. What's left is the sound of the sea and the wind, the calls of the birds and the crash of the waves and the rocks. That's pretty much what life was like on the main coast in the early 1900s as Lila Severn stepped off the steamer that ferried her to Matinicus Rock. The year was 1915, and Miss Severance was about to start her new position as a traveling school teacher, the first ever such teacher in the United States. The lighthouses themselves became her classrooms. Science lessons were found on in the inlets and among the wave splash rocks. Geography could be taught in the uppermost part of the light, where the view through the windows was itself the lesson. Miss Severance taught the children during the day and the parents at night, staying usually a week or so at each light then moving on. In her four years on the job, she traveled hundreds of miles along the main coast in steamers, mission boats, and dories. What she learned while teaching others was that the Lighthouse families were a hearty lot. 
and closely knit. In many cases, a family became so much a part of life at a light station that their name became inseparable from the lore of the lighthouse. Hendrick's headlight at the entrance to the Sheepscot River is one such light. Jerome Marr was born in the same year as the light itself was built, 1829. After his service with the Union Army during the Civil War, he returned to Maine, and in 1866 became the keeper at Hendrick's Head. Marr and his wife Catherine raised five children at the light, two girls and three boys, and local legend tells of a story of one other very special child who arrived at Hendrick's Head and into the Marr family. Sometime in the late 1870s, the records of the date are a bit sketchy. The vessel ran aground near the light, but high winds and rough seas made it impossible to even attempt a rescue. As the helpless keeper watched the doomed ship, a bundle washed onto shore. When Marr and his wife untied the water-soaked bundle, to their surprise, they found a box in the middle with a crying baby girl nested safely inside and very much alive. As with many of the old stories for which documentation is scarce, there is still a great deal of disagreement about whether this all ever happened. Was there ever a baby found on the rocks at Hendrick's Head? Well, most believe there was. And one version of the story goes on to say that the Marr family adopted the orphan girl and raised it as their own. A more reliable ending, however, has been provided by one of Gerald and Catherine Marr's own descendants. She has told many that yes, that baby girl was found and was christened by Grandpa Marr, called fittingly Seaborn. But the child was not taken into the Marr family. No, she was adopted by a local doctor on the mainland. Well, whatever the truth is on this one tale, the Marr family was part of life at Hendrick's Head long enough to field countless questions about the mysterious baby. In fact, all three of Gerald and Catherine Marr's sons went into the lighthouse service. And it was their son, Wolcott Marr, who wrote in the log at Hendrick's Head, July 1, 1895, arrived at this station at 2 p.m. to relieve Mr. Gerald Marr, who has been the keeper here for the past 29 years. 29 years, and the keeper's position passed only from one generation to the next, as Wolcott took over from his father. The younger Marr had married, and he in turn went on to raise his own nine children at Hendrick's Headlight. Portland Headlight, standing proudly in Casco Bay, is another main lighthouse with strong family ties and a wealth of family stories. The light was commissioned in 1789 by John Hancock, then the governor of Massachusetts, an area which at the time included what is now the state of Maine. Portland Headlight became the first light station completed under the newly created United States Lighthouse Establishment, which later became the United States Lighthouse Service. Portland Headlight has been home to a number of keepers over the years, beginning with the appointment by President George Washington of Captain Joseph Greenleaf, the first keeper there whose time in that position is unfortunately only thinly documented. But a dynasty of sorts began with the appointment of Keeper Joshua Strout in 1869. The Strout family, Joshua, his wife May, and their sons would be a presence on the light for nearly a hundred years until the 1950s. Joshua's son Joseph would rise from assistant keeper in 1904, serving at Portland for more than 51 years. Captain Joe, as he was fondly called, was to become one of the most popular keepers in Maine Lighthouse history. Joseph Strout raised his family on the light too, and his son John would in turn become assistant keeper at Portland Headlight. Living at a lighthouse may sound like a pleasant possibility, but these are not vacation spots by any stretch of the imagination. Though many of the locations were, and remain undeniably beautiful, and some decommissioned lights have been turned into B&Bs and inns, lighthouse keeping was a job, and in the early days it was particularly difficult and dangerous. Every single light station was built for a purpose, to help guide ships through the dangers of Maine's rocky coast, or to guide sailors into and out of harbors. 
But even with the assistance of the mechanical lights and signals, many ships still ran aground in the fierce Atlantic storms or became lost in the notoriously thick coastal fog. This is where the valor of the keepers of the lights was at its greatest, because it was not only the light station itself that was the lifesaver, but the keepers and their families who stood between the sailors and the sea. At Libby Island Light, for instance, unwary mariners faced a particular problem, because Libby Island is really two smaller islands connected by a bar, which is fully visible only at low tide. The resulting elusive waterway between the two sections of the island has more than once looked like safe passage to a sailor unfamiliar with the waters. Because even at highest tides, the bar remains a hazard below the surface of the water and at a depth to be a danger to any ship of substantial size. The logs at Libby Island record more than 38 shipwrecks between 1856 and 1906, either at that bar or on the rocks surrounding the island. Still, true to their purpose to save lives, in those 38 wrecks of ships, mostly with full crews, only 19 lives were lost, surely due to the tireless efforts of the keepers of Libby Island Light. Yes, the light keeper was more than that. At all the main lighthouses, the keepers and their families were truly life savers. And the days and nights of the keeper and his family were filled even during those precious days when they were free of foul weather and ships in danger. There was cleaning and painting of the tower and the other buildings to be done. Salt, wind, and storms all took an aggressive toll on a simple coat of paint. Yet maintaining it was an absolute necessity because it protected the structure itself and the color and design of a tower's markings were two ways a sailor could identify a lighthouse from the sea. The keeper was also entrusted with maintenance of the machinery of the fog signal and the light itself. It would be many years before the advent of electricity and solar power and the early lights were created by burning wood, whale oil, paraffin, or other oils and keeping the light burning was no easy task. And that fog signal, if the station had one, was of terrific importance. The sudden appearance of fog over main waters has always been a particular problem. While certain factors can predict whether fog will be an issue, the fog itself has always been dangerously unpredictable. It can come in picturesque wisps or descend like a curtain, completely obscuring what only moments ago was clearly visible. For a ship relying on only a compass and visual navigation, fog is a dreadful enemy, and losing track of the rocky shoals in the fog can mean certain disaster for a ship's captain. The beacon from a light station can help, but sometimes the demonic fog can obscure even that. So it was that audible fog signals became an integral part of the light stations, because where light could not breach the fog, it was hoped that sound could. The first fog signal in the United States was installed at Boston Harbor in 1719, and it was simply a cannon, but it did its job by sending out a booming voice, piercing the fog. The first bell signal was used in 1820 at West Quaddy, and it too warned countless sailors away from the shore when fog was present. So the lighthouse keeper then had two weapons at his disposal to aid in the warning of ships, the light and the fog signal. Whether that signal was a cannon, bell, whistle, or horn, and over time nearly all of these had been tried at one station or another. But an understanding of nature and science can be elusive, and fog signals have not always worked as the keepers might have wished. Sometimes the difficulties have been the greatest with the danger of fog is the worst. The Penobscot Bay Area is notorious for sudden, thick, disabling fog. So, white headlight in the bay was a necessary spot for a fog signal. Still, over the years, it had been reported that Whitehead's fog signal, which could be reliably heard for miles across the ocean, would be lost completely at certain distances from the station. Sailing toward Whitehead, a captain could hear the steam whistle clearly, then suddenly, it would be gone. The problem has been a concern for the entire active life of the station and had been studied numerous times by experts. 
But after all, it comes down to the fact that man can't always understand or predict nature. And the changing acoustics of sea and sky cannot always be counted on to act as we expect them to. At stations like Whitehead, the relationship between the fog signal and the light itself is extremely important. The original light at Whitehead was an impressive third order Fresnel, a lens so large that an adult can fit inside of it. Currently, the station has a contemporary 300 millimeter green light, but the lovely Fresnel has been saved, thanks to Ken Black of the Shore Village Museum in Rockland, Maine. Black was in the United States Coast Guard when he realized that so much of lighthouse history was in grave danger of being lost and he soon began collecting every imaginable artifact from lighthouses. But what especially interested him were the lenses. As the lights have been automated, the original lenses have no longer been of practical value, and many have been lost. But Ken Black, known as Mr. Lighthouse to many, has managed to collect more than a hundred styles of lenses and lights at his museum, which now boasts the largest collection of lenses in the country. And Whitehead's impressive lens is there, where Mr. Lighthouse will encourage visitors to peer inside and see the world through the eyes of a lighthouse. It is a solitary vision, but remember, life at a lighthouse was a solitary one, and isolation was very much a factor, even at the more hospitable stations nearer to the mainland. The keeper's families were often alone and had to be entirely self-sufficient between the infrequent trips to shore or visits by the service vessel. The animals, food stores, and supplies all needed tending. And of course, there was also housekeeping and care of the family. Even such simple tasks as tending the yard and the home were of great importance to every keeper because inspections by the lighthouse service could occur at any time, sometimes with no greater warning than the sight of the official tender ship on the horizon, flying the unmistakable flag of the lighthouse inspector. Lights such as Portland Headlight and Pamela Point with more direct connections to the mainland were perhaps some of the easier living situations for keepers. But for a very different take on life at a light station, let's visit the twin lights at Matinicus Rock. It is considered by many to be one of Maine's most desolate and lonely light stations. It is probably most readily associated with Abby Burgess. A partially fictionalized retelling of her childhood days at Matinicus Rock is known to many school children through the book, Keep the Lights Burning Abby. Isolated though it may have been, Abby fell in love with Matinicus the moment she arrived when she was only 14. It was 1853 when Abby came to the island with her mother and siblings when her father was appointed the keeper. Being more than unusually susceptible to the ravages of the North Atlantic weather, Matinicus Rock provided Abby with a life defined by storms and the tribulations of nature. It was during a landmark storm in her 17th year, 1856, that Abby's fortitude was first sternly tested. The gale that blew across Matinicus Rock that January descended in force while Abby's father and brother were ashore, and it howled for three straight days, marooning the men of the family on the mainland. With foresight beyond her years, and even as the storm reached hurricane proportions, Abby gathered the family into one of their towers, thinking even to collect her pet chickens it would be a full four weeks before the storm relented enough to allow her father to return from the mainland to the lighthouse. And it was those rescued chickens that helped keep the Burgess family alive during a similarly dangerous and devastating storm the following year, when for nearly three weeks and for lack of supplies, the family survived on just one cup of cornmeal and one precious egg per day. Of course, Matinicus Rock was not the only lighthouse to be home to farm animals of all sorts. In fact, for many lighthouse families, life on the light was very much like life on the farm. But this is a good moment to consider the differences in the physical characteristics of the many main light stations. Many were idyllic with wide swaths of grass and greenery, with room for gardens and for children to play. According to Ella Cheney Robinson, whose father, Jasper Cheney, was the keeper at Libby Island Light, despite their northern location at the entrance to Machias Bay, there was always a large vegetable garden at their home on the light. They even had a cranberry bog on the 120 acres at Libby. Cranberries were also cultivated at Petit Manan each year. 
Maisie Freeman, whose father James Freeman was the first assistant keeper at Petit Manan all through the 1930s, remembers her life on that rocky point of land as being a complete paradise. She and her brothers and sisters had room to play, explore, or just watch quietly from the light tower as the light of each summer day dimmed into evening. One day in 1937, Maisie and her siblings were called by their mother to watch the sky because something amazing was soon to pass overhead. The airship Hindenburg. The German dirigible was on its way to a landing further down the Atlantic coast, and the Freemans were perhaps among the few who were the last to see the airship underway before it crashed landed in a New Jersey field. In terms of a lighthouse with pastoral landscape, Whitehead Light in Penobscot Bay was nearly perfect. The keeper's house and the tower could almost pass for a farmhouse and silo, surrounded as they were with expanses of rich greenery, soil for gardens, and even forests. Fresh water was collected in cisterns in the basement of the keeper's house, for use by not only the keeper and his family, but also for irrigation of vegetables and plants. But unlike the pleasant landscape at Whitehead, other light stations were located on small islands jutting out from the sea, hardly islands really, often aptly referred to as rocks. Because that's pretty much all there was there, just a light station perched on a rock surrounded by the ocean. Mount Desert Rock is one such appropriately named station. However, the keepers and their families who called Mount Desert Rock home in the years before its automation almost always had gardens for vegetables, with even a few flowers to remind them of the mainland. But Mount Desert really is a rock, 26 miles out onto the Atlantic, with virtually no soil to speak of. So, gardening there for food or simple pleasure meant that the keepers had to haul soil out to the rock by boat, sometimes trading with local fishermen for a barrel of topsoil or fertilizer. Each year, the gardens were laid and tended, only to be washed away into the sea again as the winter storms took hold. On nearly every main light station, someone, the keeper, his wife, children, made use of what ground they had to keep chickens, sometimes pigs for butchering, and frequently a cow or two for the milk. Connie Small, whose biography, The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife, was one lighthouse wife who kept chickens to feed the family and to help provide a feeling of mainland life. It was one of her many duties while she and husband Elson were stationed at St. Croix River Light to feed and tend the chickens each day. But it was Elson who was behind another addition to life at St. Croix, Blossom the Cow. Elson, it seems, hated canned milk. And of course, this was the 1930s, and St. Croix River Light was on an island, so there was no stopping by the corner market. But Elson knew that fresh milk was to be had if a cow could be acquired. So he built a large flat-bottomed boat, bought himself a cow on a trip to the mainland, and brought her over to the island. Now, fresh milk or not, Connie was less than thrilled with Blossom the cow, who was allowed to roam the island at will. Nevertheless, Blossom became a fixture at St. Croix River Light, and Elson could be spotted at the milking faithfully twice each day, usually with a lighthouse cat in attendance, hoping to catch a squirt of fresh milk by the by. Probably the best known and most revered animals of Maine lighthouses were the various dogs who kept company with the lighthouse families over the years. Of course, a pet's first duty was to the family, but many lighthouse dogs became known for their special skills and their natural intuition in making themselves an invaluable part of life on the light. Pauline Hamer was the daughter of the keeper at Owl's Head Light. During the 1930s, her constant companion on the light was her beloved Spot, a dog who became uniquely adapted to his life at the lighthouse. Apparently, Spot never lost his fascination for the passing vessels, and he learned to ring the fog bell and pull the cord, ringing the bell as the vessels passed. There were many boats who came to rely on Spot's ringing of the fog bell from Owl's head, and each would answer the bell with a blast of the horn, and with the exchange of the bell and horn, would be able to steer clear of the dangerous rocks surrounding the head. But somehow Spot must have known his real purpose was not just the playful ringing of the bell, but the warning to those passing ships. 
The wife of the captain of the mailboat out of Matinicus Island relates a story of one stormy night when fearing for her husband in the storm. She telephoned the lighted owl's head and asked that they let Spot out to ring the bell to help guide her husband around the treacherous rocks. The storm was so severe and the snow so deep that the dog couldn't make it to the bell. But fearlessly, Spot clambered to the edge of the cliff, the furthest point he could possibly reach, and barked for all he was worth. Soon, three short blasts sounded from the passing mailboat, and within a few nervous hours, word came from the captain's home that he had made it safely past Owl's Head, thanks to Spot. Then, of course, there's Nemo. Heron Neck Light Station had no fog signal in 1900, at least not a mechanical one. But it did have Captain Farnham and his faithful dog, Nemo. Farnham had trained Nemo to employ his booming bark at the first sign of fog. As soon as the first wisp would roll in, Nemo would take up his station at the extreme end of the island. At the first sound of a boat, whistle, or horn, Nemo would bark, and his barking would carry back to the fog-bound ship and help its crew avoid the dangers of the island. Never tiring, Nemo would wait out even the most tenacious foul weather, responding to each ship in turn. Now, Nemo apparently loved lighthouse life, and he loved the water, but that wasn't so of all lighthouse dogs. Assistant keeper Buster Glazelle came to Egg Rock Light in the early 1930s, and with him came his Labrador, Babe. Oddly enough for a dog who would spend most of his life at a lighthouse, Babe hated the water. And people have since wondered whether Babe sensed something about the ultimate power of the sea that would unfortunately escape Glazelle himself. The sea would not be Babe's undoing, but Glazelle's. There was nothing particularly unusual about that day in 1935 when Glazelle shoved off for the mainland in his little skiff. Having grown up in the area and served at the light for a number of years, he knew his way around the waters of Frenchman Bay. A while after he left, however, his superior, Keeper J.B. Pinkham, realized that he needed an additional errand taken care of on the mainland, and he telephoned Blazelle's destination to say so. That's when he found out that Blazelle had not arrived as expected. It was hours later that Pinkham in his own boat found Blazelle's overturned skiff. The coastal waters of Maine are frightfully cold in the dead of winter, and Pinkham knew all too well that if Blazelle had fallen, or been thrown into the sea, he would not have survived those bitter temperatures. The Coast Guard joined the search, but it wasn't until a month later that Glazelle's family would know his fate when his body was found by fishermen working the waters. Why an experienced boatman would lose a skiff in calm weather has never been explained. Sometimes, unfortunately, it seems that the sea laughs at us, and its only purpose is to destroy seagoing vessels. That's why lighthouses exist at all. They were built for one purpose only, to save lives. And though many lives, like the Zells, had been lost in the service of the lights, many more have been saved. Owl's Head Light was the site of one of the most unique rescue stories in lighthouse history. In December 1850, just two days before Christmas, Lydia Dyer braved storm and sea to row out past Owl's Head to the schooner in which her fiancé, Richard Ingraham, was serving. In the joy of their reunion, shared with all on board the ship over a few glasses of wine, none of the crew took heed as the storm grew worse with each passing hour. It took just a single crushing wave to smash the ship against the rocks at Owl's Head. Richard rushed to save Lydia, bundling themselves together in blankets and lashing them both to the ship. His shipmate, Roger Elliott, had what would prove to be the presence of mind to join them bundling himself into the icy, wet tangle of blankets and bodies. Throughout the night, as the storm raged and the three bodies became encased in solid ice, only Elliot remained conscious. As the storm drew back with the dawn, Elliot was able to free himself. With great effort, dragged his frostbitten body toward the keeper's house at Owl's Head. Lighthouse keeper William Masters and the others from the island, who had come at the sound of the lighthouse rescue bell, Together, were able to slowly, carefully thaw and revive Richard and Lydia, both of whom almost completely frozen when found. It was during a slightly less dramatic storm in 1886 
that the Annie C. McGuire struck the hull-eating rocks off Portland Head. Keeper Joseph Stroud and his family had just settled in for a Christmas Eve dinner when warning came of a ship on the rocks. Thanks to the efforts of the keepers and their families at Portland Headlight, every member of the crew of the Annie McGuire was saved, though they were hungry and sea-weary lot when they finally made it to safety. According to Strout's telling of the tale, that was one Christmas dinner that was appreciated by more than just his family, as even the captain of the Annie C. McGuire, his wife, and their 12-year-old son settled in for a three-day stay with the Strout family. Of course, ships have ended up at some of the main lights without any damage at all, coming ashore in a more usual fashion, docking to deliver supplies, or simply on a visit. But during World War II, Boone Island Light witnessed one of the more unusual landings in Maine lighthouse history. Kelvin Dolby and his wife Miriam were residents of the island at the time, and they recount the surrender in 1944 of a German submarine in the waters off Boone Island. That was one ship delivered to a Maine lighthouse without a scratch. Boone Island, of course, has been the site of a number of fantastic stories over the years, and very early in its history, it developed a reputation as a difficult and desolate station. What is perhaps the most infamous incident in the island's history predates the light itself. On December 11, 1710, hurricane force winds prevailed in the Gulf of Maine, and the British ship Nottingham Galley, sailing from Ireland to Boston, was driven aground on the rocks at Boone. Just three days before they would be spotted and rescued in acts of desperation, the survivors had surrendered to cannibalism. Soon after the rescue, it is said local fishermen began stocking the island with barrels of food, which would wait for the next unfortunate souls who might run aground there. Many say that's where the island's name comes from, from the boon of finding resources where none naturally exist. Because Boone Island is truly a desolate place, it has required a special soul to survive life there as a keeper. Captain William C. Williams had one of the longest stretches, starting in 1885 and toughing it out on the island until 1911. The Williams family was not alone on Boone, though, but as was required by the lighthouse service, the station was manned by sometimes three keepers at a time, 24 hours a day, every day. Because it was such a trying outpost, Often the keepers' families would spend their winters on the mainland, leaving the men to tend the island alone during the threatening winters. But in the many summers, Boone Island was home to many children and grandchildren. Over time, they have told stories of loving the place to dreading it. Keeper William's grandchildren love the island, it seems, telling tales of exploration of the tide pools and many a dinner of freshly boiled lobster at the rocks at the edge of the sea. Often they had the whales and the gulls and the seals as playmates. But in the late 1800s, a young girl who wrote under the pen name of Annie Bell Hobbs sent a desperate message to a children's magazine describing Boone Island as a rock eight miles from the nearest point of land upon which I have been held prisoner. Perhaps Annie would have appreciated the recent actions taken by the American Lighthouse Foundation. In an effort to raise funds so desperately needed to restore the light, a campaign was mounted to declare Boone Island a sovereign independent republic. And that's exactly what was done on April 1, 2003. Well, let's face it, neither of the nearby towns of York or Kittery has lifted a finger or spent a cent in recent years on behalf of the inhabitants of the island. There's no upkeep of the roads, no phone service, no emergency service. Of course, there are no inhabitants of Boone Island unless you count some of the local wildlife. Though it remains an active aid to navigation, Boone Island was automated in 1980, and the last keepers left the island in the 1970s. But it is one of the 16 lights now in the care of the American Lighthouse Foundation, and one of many in dire need of restoration. And that's what the American Lighthouse Foundation intends to do. So all the money raised from the sales of citizenships, government and political offices, yes, they are available at a price. Corruption is rampant on Boone Island. All that money will go to the restoration of the lighthouse. Preserving these historic lights is so extremely important, and it is an effort being undertaken by the dedicated volunteers at a number of nonprofits, such as the West Quaddy Head Lightkeepers Association, Friends of Doubling Point, Friends of Seguin Island, Pine Island Camp at Whitehead Light, and the Friends of Nash Island Light, 
as well as government agencies such as the Maine Department of Marine Resources, who currently cares for Burnt Island Light. But it is the American Lighthouse Foundation who is leading the way in the rescue and restoration of Maine's lighthouses. Through its numerous French chapters, Rockland Breakwater, Wood Island, Perkins Island, Pemaquid Point, and through the volunteer efforts of so many individuals, the American Lighthouse Foundation has been able to make some headway in saving Maine's historic lighthouses. And this is important not only because of the history represented by lighthouses, but because, well, people are just drawn to the lights. In lighthouses, people see nobility and strength, pride and hope, the past and the future. People plan their vacations around lighthouses. People fall in love with lighthouses, and some even fall in love at lighthouses. It's amazing, actually, how many people are just crazy about lighthouses. This is how the Lighthouse Depot in Wells, Maine came to be. They realized that people wanted to remember lighthouses they had visited and the times they had had there. They wanted to understand more about the lights and the people who worked at them and lived at them. And to answer that need, the folks at Lighthouse Depot in Wells developed the largest selection anywhere of lighthouse memorabilia, books, videos, clothing, and just about anything else you can imagine. Perhaps we don't need to understand why, but it's just plain to see that people just love the lights. Lighthouses are simply compelling, what they stand for and what they mean to so many. But we have to make the connection. Appreciation for the beauty of the lights must be turned into action focused on their preservation. We are fascinated by the lights, but without deliberate efforts to preserve them, one day most could be gone. Saving the lights is a considerable task, and one with so many facets, from simple care of the light stations themselves, to the collection and management of lighthouse artifacts and records. Because it's not just the lights themselves that are at risk, but the very history of these people and places. When the Coast Guard absorbed the responsibilities of the United States Lighthouse Service in 1939, much of the lighthouse history was discarded or packed away in boxes of family memorabilia. This is no fault of the Coast Guard, of course, whose greater purposes range from safety of navigation in U.S. waters to national security. But it is a fact that much of lighthouse history is gone and much remains undiscovered and therefore at risk of being lost. This is one effort with which the American Lighthouse Foundation has had some success. Because people do donate lighthouse memorabilia or records from the family collections or those found packed away in a box that belonged to Grandma. As a result, the collection at the Museum of Lighthouse History in Wells, Maine is growing and now has substantial archives with material reaching back to the days of Thomas Jefferson. The records we can read and research to help us understand what life was like in the days before global positioning systems and elaborate digital aids to navigation. And these lighthouses are places we can visit and view, and these are all slices of history that must be saved. The American Lighthouse Foundation exists to do just that, help to save the lighthouses. And they have had some success in doing just that. Most recently, thanks to the efforts of many people, including the Friends of Little River Light, on October 2, 2001, hundreds of people from all over the state witnessed an historic event, the relighting of Little River Light in Cutler, Maine. After more than 26 years, the light in the tower that guards Cutler Harbor came back on. Though the sun had not yet set and the sky was still bright despite looming storms, the light from the tower could be clearly seen and remained lit, growing brighter as the evening descended. It seems so simple, just switch the light back on. But the relighting of Little River marked the culmination of efforts by numerous volunteers as well as the United States Coast Guard. More than $25,000 of donated funds went for the paint and other materials needed to bring the iron and brick tower back to life, along with countless volunteer hours, time spent at the less than glamorous tasks of scraping and cleaning, cutting and clearing, painting and retooling. But finally, the pedestal in the tower, which once supported the now long-lost original Fifth Order Fresnel lens, was freshly painted and ready for the Coast Guard to install the modern optic lens. What a glorious sight it was to see Little River come back to life. 
in one of the finest examples of the true spirit of the light, Little River again shines in Cutler Harbor as a testament to safety, surety, and the indomitable American spirit. But Little River's story is far from finished. It has since become just the third light in the United States and the first in all of New England to see its ownership transferred under the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000. As new owners of the station, the American Lighthouse Foundation now faces the considerable task of restoring the other buildings at the site, including the Keeper's House and Boathouse, both of which remain in dire need of repair. Would any of Little River's past keepers recognize the light today with its fresh face? Certainly, earlier keepers would be puzzled by the white paint on the tower itself because Little River was among a number of stations in Maine whose towers were once painted chocolate brown. However, Ruth Corbett Ferris would recognize it and be particularly pleased to see the restored tower. Ruth was the daughter of Willie Corbett, who was the keeper of the Little River Light during the 1930s. Captain Corbett's lighthouse service began in 1908 when he served an apprenticeship at Saddleback Ledge, reportedly one of the worst assignments for a keeper. Corbett went on to serve at a number of other stations, Tenet's Harbor and Monhegan among them, before coming to Little River with his wife, herself the daughter of a previous lighthouse keeper there. Their daughter Ruth spent the first 24 years of her life at the station and remained connected to and concerned about its future all her life. But one need not be actually from a lighthouse family to be drawn to the lights to care about them. So many people have been over the years. Even today, people are fascinated by lighthouses. They are drawn to them in great numbers. They want to know more about them. Why was it built? Who lived here? Was it a lonely or scary place to live? What did they do? So many questions. And we only have some of the answers because this is the very history that is at risk as the descendants of these families disappear and as the light station buildings fall into disrepair. Thankfully, many of the photographs, letters, and other documents of everyday life at the lights are being brought to the attention of the American Lighthouse Foundation and other preservation groups. Images of times, people, and a lifelong past. We are reminded of these when we see images of the lights in more contemporary formats, such as the photo of Maine's noble light that traveled aboard NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft in 1977, and Pemico Point's proud placement as the first lighthouse to ever appear on the United States quarter. Or what is perhaps one of the most interesting ways in which a Maine lighthouse has become part of popular culture, we have to take a look at Cape Elizabeth Light. The famous American painter Edward Hopper first captured the spirit of Cape Elizabeth in his paintings. His Lighthouse Hill showed the house and east tower at Cape Elizabeth. Though the house today is slightly changed from what Hopper saw, the tower still stands, now under the stewardship of the American Lighthouse Foundation. Hopper's painting was selected by the United States Postal Service when they issued their stamp in commemoration of Maine statehood in 1970. But before that, it is said Hopper's Lighthouse Hill, which also showed the Keeper's House, became an inspiration for film director Alfred Hitchcock and his film Psycho. It is widely believed that Hitchcock based his image of the house at the Bates Motel on the Keeper's House at Cape Elizabeth, immortalizing that image as part of a creepier story than anyone who had ever lived at Cape Elizabeth might have imagined. But Hitchcock was not the only one in Hollywood who drew inspiration from the mystery and allure of the lighthouses. Lighthouses have long been popular with the print media and film. But as far as we know, Cape Elizabeth is the only light ever actually owned by a member of the Hollywood elite. The West Tower at Cape Elizabeth has come and gone in many ways since it and its sister East Tower were built in 1827 as range lights. These were the first twin lighthouses built on the main coast. But it is the East Tower that would prove the most useful and tenacious. And it is the one still in use today as an active aid to navigation. The West Tower, however, was discontinued and extinguished in 1924. But it was many years later, in 1971, when Hollywood again discovered Cape Elizabeth Light. Actor Gary Merrill, known for his work on the silver screen and as the ex-husband of actress Betty Davis, purchased the West Tower in 1971. Merrill was by then considered eccentric by many, but he was active in Maine politics, making an unsuccessful run for governor in 1968 and even a run for the presidency. He later sold the West Tower at Cape Elizabeth, but didn't leave lighthouses behind. He eventually bought a lighthouse in Canada, 
where he spent his remaining years. The twin lights at Cape Elizabeth were also the site of one of the most daring rescues in lighthouse history. During a wretched January storm in the winter of 1885, despite being ill with a cold and exhausted, keeper Marcus Hanna kept the fog whistle sounding all through that dreadful night. The snow and storms that night had been so severe and loud that it wasn't until nearly 9 a.m. that morning that Hannah's wife spotted a schooner aground on Dyer's Ledge. It was the vessel Australia. No one at the light knew it at the time, but the captain of the Australia had already been swept into the sea, and the two remaining crew members who had taken to the rigging were nearly frozen to death. Hannah was, however, a man of incredible courage, a hero of the Civil War, and neither storm nor sea was going to stop him from reaching the men on that ship. For his efforts in the rescue of the crew, Marcus Hanna was awarded a gold life-saving medal. And many years later, his feat was recognized again as the United States Coast Guard christened its new 125-foot buoy tender, the Marcus Hanna. That vessel now calls South Portland, just around the corner from Cape Elizabeth, its home port. The towers of Cape Elizabeth may have changed their stripes over the years, but their purpose has always been that which Hannah so perfectly exemplified, to save lives. And there have been many times when the lives of their own people were saved in some way by the lights. Life at a lighthouse had its rewards, but it was one also fraught with hazards, often relating to things people in more ordinary living circumstances would take for granted. On a cold and foggy November night at Wood Island Light, Keeper Burnham and his wife realized that their daughter Tammy was running a dangerously high fever, and in a call to their doctor in the mainland, they were advised to get the child to a hospital as soon as possible. This was no simple task, because Wood Island Light sits on a small island in the mouth of the Saco River. Keeper Burnham was instructed by the Coast Guard to not leave his post to the light. They would send a boat to pick up and deliver Tammy to the mainland. That boat was dispatched from the Fletcher's Neck Life Saving Station, but because of the rough weather condition, the Coast Guard would have to launch a small skiff to actually reach the island. Edward Savinsky was a mere 19 years old at the time he set foot in that skiff and just a seaman apprentice, but he reached the light and he managed to retrieve Tammy, who was all bundled up in a pink snowsuit. However, that skiff never reached the Coast Guard vessel, but capsized and Savinsky and Tammy ended up in the frigid waters. Against all odds, he hung on to the child, bobbing up and down countless times, finally landing on a small rock outcropping west of the station. At last, the searchlight from the Coast Guard ship lit upon the bright pink of Tammy's snowsuit as she lay, now nearly frozen on the rocks. Having ignored the orders of the Coast Guard and searching in his own boat for his daughter, Keeper Burnham spotted them and managed to drag Savinsky and his daughter into his own boat and deliver them to the Coast Guard vessel. Still, the storm and heavy fog would have prevented the ship from entering the harbor were it not for the efforts of a local lobsterman who took his own boat out to guide the larger ship in and eventually delivered Tammy to shore in his own boat. It was not until 32 years later, in 1992, that any of the heroes of this story received official recognition. Ultimately, Tammy Burnham was reunited with Edward Savinsky, and the following citations were awarded to Lawyer Burnham and Edward Savinsky, the United States Coast Guard Life-Saving Medal, and to Preston Alley, the lobsterman whose small boat carried Tammy Burnham to safety of shore, a Distinguished Public Service Award. For all its history, Wood Island Light remains one of Maine's lights most at risk. The American Lighthouse Foundation, along with its Friends chapter, has begun efforts for its restoration. Of course, Tammy's trip to the shore that night was a dangerous one, but there were other ways to reach waiting boats. A hoist was created at Saddleback Ledge Light to do just that, help people move from boat to shore, and could reportedly carry as many as two people at a time. For a time, Cape Nettick Nubble Light saw one of the most unique forms of transport. Designed for moving supplies back and forth, the bucket on a pulley installed there was actually used to transport one keeper's young son to shore, a practice that stopped when the keeper's superiors found out about it. 
A previous keeper at Nubble, William Brooks, saw opportunity in the transportation problems and began ferrying locals and sightseers to the island. The cost, 10 cents apiece. But it is at Saddleback Ledge that we can see some of the sadness of Maine's lighthouse history. This was always a lonely and desolate station, but one that was home to keepers' families for most of its active life. Children would be confined to just the boardwalk, or worse, in winter months confined to the house by ice and howling winds. Supply vessels could not often safely land to deliver the cargo. Still, with its odd profile and stubby and pugnacious granite tower, the light has long been an absolute necessity in Ilaho Bay. We know some of its history, that the original keeper's quarters were in the tower itself, that it was a remarkably expensive lighthouse when it was first built, coming in at 15000 We know that the family of Saddleback's first keeper, Watson Hopkins, even saw the birth of a child on the island. And we know that in 1927, keeper Leonard Bosworth Dudley and his assistant Edward Howell saw the quite unexpected arrival of hundreds of ducks and seabirds. The creatures were apparently attracted by the light, and many crashed against the windows of the tower to their peril. But there is so much we still do not know about Saddleback Ledge and all the other main lighthouses. This is history that simply must be saved before it disappears completely, before another light station faces oblivion with no one interested or able enough to assist in its intact survival, as was the case with the light at Eagle Island. No one came forward when the Coast Guard put the buildings up for sale in 1963, perhaps because the structures came with the attached condition that they must be removed from the island. Despite public outcry, the Coast Guard proceeded with plans to raise all the buildings at the site, with the exception of the light tower. When the crews attempted to remove the fog bell, it got away from them and tumbled into the sea. Perhaps even an inanimate object can try to make an exit on its own terms. And the bell was eventually recovered by a local fisherman and brought to its new home on shore. Though it is now maintained by Eagle Island caretakers as part of the main lights program, with the destruction of the house and the buildings at Eagle Island went some of its history. This and the history of all main lighthouses is something that we simply cannot afford to lose. They are mysterious, glorious, fascinating. We are drawn to the lights by their strength, their beauty, their romance, their history. For hundreds of years, they have been the hope of safe harbor, heroism, hardship, a place to live, and a place to play. The warmth of home, the image of the American spirit. Maine's lighthouses have earned us the moniker of the lighthouse state and brought countless numbers of visitors to our coastline. But buildings reduced to rubble no longer house the spirits of their keepers. History lost is no longer history. Artifacts and buildings destroyed no longer bear witness. A light extinguished is darkness. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can help save the lighthouses.